continue to let people in. Oops, okay. Um, so the first thing I wanna ask everybody, except maybe uh, the speaker, is if you could mute your microphones, that does help with any background noise. So that's always helpful. Mm -hmm. um, welcome to the November meetup of the League of Women Voters of Saratoga County. And um, tonight we will have a, a presentation on voter suppression. I would like to take just a minute to update you on future league events. So um, let's see, we have on Monday, December 6th, we are screening the film Whitewashed, The Racism Project at the Bowtie Theater at 7 p.m. Linda McKenney's on here, I can see her. Um, this is limited to 50 people and it should um, be a very, very interesting um, view of racism. And uh, we're very fortunate to have Linda bring this to the Bowtie Theater in Saratoga Springs. Uh, I assume there's a cost for the uh, regular cost for this, Linda, but I don't know. No, it's free. It's free. All right. Yeah. So no, no excuse not to be there. Exactly. Right. <laughs> we will also, as, uh, as we always have every year, participate in any of the MLK events that will be happening January 14th to 17th in the year 2022. And on January 19th, um, we uh, will have our next meetup and our league will be reviewing the national and state positions. This will be on Zoom, as it always is. We will not have a December meetup. So this will be the last one um, of the year tonight. And um, Joanna Lasher also has uh, an announcement that she needs to make for uh, the environmental group. Okay, I think, I'm, yeah, I'm- There you are. <laughs> okay, we have a Zoom program, which we just uh, finalized the date. Um, coming up on Wednesday, January 12th, 2022. And we're pretty excited. We've got a speaker, Peter Ivanovich. Uh, he's the executive director of Environmental Advocates of New York. And he's a member of the New York State Climate Action Council. And he's going to speak to us regarding the long awaited plan for the state of New York regarding the implementation of New York's climate law and its equity provisions. So that's coming up in January. Thank you, Joanna. Um, as always, uh, refer to our website, League of Women Voters Saratoga for uh, further links, information, and also to sign up for um, any of the Zoom links and just go to the events and scroll down until you find the one you're interested in. And remember, you can always support League of Women Voters with a membership or by being a volunteer. So anyone new to this organization, we'd love to have you involved. And um, we have many, many different opportunities at the League of Women Voters and can definitely link you up with somebody um, if you don't really know what you wanna do or you can email president at lwvsaratoga.org. Do I have that right? I hope. Anyway, that's on the website also. Um, so as a reminder, uh, microphones off during the presentation, we will do questions at the end, or you can put questions or comments up in your in the chat. And um, I think that's as far as I need to go as far as instruction. I think most of the people here are very good about understanding how to go about doing this. So I'll introduce our speaker tonight. And Perry Grossman is a senior staff attorney of the Voting Rights Project of the New York Civil Liberties Union. New York State, a progressive leader on social issues, has been behind the curve regarding voting rights and policies. New York's longstanding failure to modernize its election laws has made it a favorite punching bag for politicians seeking to justify voter suppression in places like Georgia, Texas, North Carolina, Ohio, and Florida. So Perry is going to enlighten us on this and I will turn it over to him now. Thank you, Sherry. And uh, thanks to everybody for having me. It's, it's a pleasure. Uh, 
The League of Women Voters is a not just a frequent collaborator, but sometimes client uh, of ours at the NYCLU, and we are delighted to work together. Um, and so I, I recognize I probably have a, a pretty informed audience here, and you should feel free to um, intersperse what I'm saying with, with as many questions as you want. Um, I, I, all things equal, prefer as much of an interactive discussion as possible, especially when we're, we're, we're looking at such sophisticated consumers of, of, of voting elections here. Um, and so I am going to take a little bit of a current events approach, but a little bit of an academic approach as well, because sometimes it's good to get back to first principles when it comes to, um, to understanding really what voter suppression is, because so much of it um, flies, flies below the radar. It, it, it happens in our backyards and we don't even notice because we don't necessarily know um, what to look for all the time. Um, so if you give me just a second, um, I'm actually gonna use a combination of two PowerPoints that I put together for other events, um, because as, as you may have noticed, um, exhausted new dad, hard time putting time, new, new stuff together right now, especially with a lot going on. Um, but I will do the best I can, I, I expect. Um, a lot of good good questions along the way. So as Sherry mentioned, right, we've been dealing with a lot of voter suppression efforts uh, nationally, right? It has been since Shelby County, um, I'll, I'll mention what Shelby County is, is, is briefly, I won't get too much into the details, you're welcome to ask me about it, right? So in the Voting Rights Act of 1965, the crown jewel of the Voting Rights Act was the preclearance regime. And the preclearance regime said, that jurisdictions with a particularly bad history of discrimination would have to pre-clear any changes to their election laws um, through the United States Department of Justice or a federal district court in the District of Columbia. And um, pre-clearance had withstood, uh, withstood constitutional challenges uh, in the 60s, in the 80s, um, but finally, uh, and, and again in, in the 2000s, but then finally, in, uh, in 2013, the Supreme Court abrogated not the idea of preclearance, but the coverage formula used to apply preclearance. That's what Shelby County was. And so the second Shelby County came through and made preclearance inoperable. There was a massive rush among formerly covered states to enact strict voter ID laws, to roll back early voting, to do all kinds of things that make it unnecessarily difficult for people to vote, to, to reduce accommodations that had been really built up over time to expand the franchise uh, generally, but particularly to people of color. Um, these new voter suppression tactics, uh, they are just the descendants of uh, literacy tests, poll taxes, and requiring voters to guess the number of jelly beans in a jar. Uh, we'll get into a little bit more why in, in the academic portion of the program. How does New York fit in here, um, right? So New York, uh, three counties in New York were actually covered under uh, preclearance. Uh, Brooklyn, the Bronx, and Manhattan were all covered. Uh, as a state, of course, we have our own bad history um, of racism and xenophobia in, in voting. Uh, we had English literacy tests. We had annual registration requirements. We had, um, we still have to some extent, felon disenfranchisement laws. Um, you know, that's a real discussion of the racial inequities we face with, but we also have a system that's been deeply entrenched um, in preserving the power of political machines, and that has led to a, a, a separate kind of, of voter suppression. The reason that we don't have or did not have early voting until fairly recently and um, a lack of online registration, which we still really don't have and, and won't have uh, in place anytime soon, are all about making it difficult for new voters to enter in because um, political machines tend to be like to keep turnout relatively low. They wanna keep new voters out. Uh, new voters are just more costs, uh, more energy that has to be expended in order to um, make the political system work. There's a lot of other New York laws, things that fly below the radar, as I mentioned before, 
um, that suppress and dilute. Now, this is this mentions minority votes because again, this is something I adapted from a presentation on um, a law, a, a bill that's particularly important and hopefully coming up for for some solid votes um, early this year. The New York Voting Rights Act, the John R. Lewis Voting Rights Act of New York. Um, but the items that are mentioned here are frankly as much voter suppression in general. Um, they are differentially suppressive of minority votes. They make it, uh, they, they suppress, you know, voter of color turnout even more, but they keep voter turnout in general pretty low, right? So that's off cycle elections. We're talking about things like school district elections in May, um, village elections in March, special purpose districts in December. Um, elections that are taking place every single year, including odd years. Uh, we have at-large elections in a lot of um, a lot of our local Good governments. Morning, Most, the vast majority of uh, elections in New York State are at-large elections. Um, those are particularly susceptible to vote dilution um, because racially polarized voting is really, really common. Um, when we've got different, uh, we actually don't have uh, just the Board of Elections running our elections. We have lots and lots of local government entities running their own elections in New York State. School districts all run their own elections. Most villages run their own elections. Special purpose districts, library, water, fire, hospital districts uh, typically run their own elections. Um, they don't necessarily use the same polling places as the Board of Elections. They don't have early voting uh, or they don't necessarily have early voting. Um, they don't have electronic poll books. There's a lot of modernizations that have been made that have not reached uh, these local elections, um, right? We still have um, excuse only absentee voting. We still have the pandemic accommodation in place, but 34 states have um, no excuse absentee balloting. Unfortunately, we're, we're still not one of them because of the failure um, of the ballot measure. And I'm sure that's a thing that we'll, we'll talk about because it's certainly something that's weighing heavy on me. Um, Oh, and we have an early registration deadline. And the early registration deadline is especially important because we have a state constitutional case challenging New York's 25-day voter registration deadline in which our client is none other than the League of Women Voters of New York State, um, right? The New York State Constitution has a 10-day registration deadline. That's what the, um, the recent ballot measure was directed at, was repealing that 10-day. But the actual voter registration cutoff in New York for most voters is 25 days, which is among the longest in the country. It's grossly unnecessary at this point, and it disenfranchises thousands and thousands of voters every single election cycle for no good reason. So I mentioned the punching bag, right? Here's, here's a fun one from Brian Kemp, right? New York has only nine days of early voting. Uh, Georgia has a minimum of 17. Uh, additional two Sundays is an option for every county. Right, New York has an ex requires an excuse to vote absentee. Georgia does not. Um, I think Brian Kemp is mostly a clown when it comes to uh, voting rights, so I felt pretty comfortable putting this in Comic Sans. Um, there's also a note at the bottom: o Ohio, North Carolina also tried this. Right, uh, Ohio rolled back early voting, and in 2016, New York had early voting, and they said, you know, we're better than New York. Uh, North Carolina put together an omnibus package that the Fourth Circuit said was surgically directed at um, disenfranchising minority voters. But in doing so, again, they pointed to New York and our lack of election modernization uh, as rationale for, for, for their, um, their voter suppression measures. Now, the fact is, um, some of that's true, right? We don't have no excuse absentee ballot. We've, we've adopted it in an ad hoc way for the pandemic, but constitutionally speaking, we, we still have it. We only have nine days of early voting. Other states have more. But um, one, we do have some features of our election laws, which are pretty good. We have the longest election day poll hours in the country, um, always a positive. And we've made a lot of really good changes since January 1st, 2019. So while Georgia and Texas and Montana and Iowa are, are rolling things back, New York's at least moving forward, adapting early voting, automatic voter registration, um, Whoa, pre-registration we've adapted. And then you'll notice the asterisks. This presentation was made before the ballot measures failed. So we're gonna have to wait uh, two more years at least um, before those come to pass. But we are generally moving in the right direction. And so um, we have a lot of catching up to do. 
right? We were I, almost the 40th state to adopt early voting. So that was a big catch up. Online registration, again, nearly 40 states have online registration. No excuse absentee, again, 34 states. That's catch up work. Um, same day registration exists in 21 states. In the District of Columbia, if we adopted that, we'd be better than most. Um, restoration on release, we have made it so that people released from prison are able and eligible to register and vote upon release. That, that puts us in better company. There's about 20 other states uh, that have that. Uh, and pre-registration for 16 and 17 year olds is, is a good thing as well. Um, a state voting rights act, which I'm, I'm happy to talk about because it's something I've invested a lot of time in, would make us a national leader. Um, California, Oregon, Washington, and Virginia all have state voting rights act as the federal uh, courts have really retreated in terms of the way they enforce um, the Voting Rights Act. Um, there's just a need for more state level protection, especially since Congress is just refusing to move in a positive direction when it comes um, to voting rights generally. Okay, I'm gonna switch PowerPoints here for a minute. Um, so give me just a second. Perry, I don't know if anybody has any questions on that portion. I, you, they're welcome to ask. Barb had a question. Yes. Uh, put it in the chat. Barb, do you want to ask it or would you prefer I read it? I can read it. Um, go ahead. Uh, my question was whether or not you consider closed primaries to be a voter suppression tactic. Consider closed primaries to be a voter suppression tactic. It's a really good question. I generally don't, um, right? Because so we've got countervailing interests when we're talking about primary elections. On the one hand, um, you know, voters want to be able to move freely and vote in the 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 election of their choice. Um, you know, to see all candidates really measured against each other. So there's there's a, there's that rationale to the, the sort of top two, um, what's sometimes called a, a jungle primary. Um, but closed primaries do have a genuine benefit in terms of being able to maintain the, the, the integrity of political parties and what exactly they stand for, right? They can say, look, if you wanna help pick our candidate, our standard bearer, um, you know, you should be willing to enroll in the party. And so I think there's, I think there's good arguments for both open and closed primaries, they result in um, you know different different outcomes. I think um, you know open primaries. I think tend to move um, outcomes a little bit closer to the center, and closed primaries tend to lead to a little bit more ideological purity on the part of of nominees. Um, not always the case. Just sort of generalizing from political science perspective, uh, there's merits to each of those. Um, so I don't see it as a form of voter suppression. I see it more as a balancing of, you know, um, sort of voter voter fluidity and choice against freedom of association and and freedom of association not just being, um, you know, about the ability of voters to to associate with any political parties, but also the the the, the right of an association to define who its members should be um, and what it stands for. So um, does that does that answer your question in some meaningful way. <laughs> okay, well, I'm gonna move on hoping that it did. Um, okay, so uh, can everyone see the slide that says what is voting? Yes. Okay, All right, so among other things, I teach a voting rights seminar at Fordham Law School. And so this is a presentation I gave to law students about voting rights work. And, and hopefully it's, it's of interest here in terms of getting back to first principles and, and then using that to evaluate the state of voting rights in New York and, and, and what's going on and, and what needs to be done next, right? So um, this is just a little bit of inspiration, right? Voting is the foundation stone of political action, um, but it also recognizes that voting is both an individual right 
and and a collective right. Um, why why is that important? Um, you know, the fact is, it's not just about our ability to for each individual to be able to get to the polls and um, and cast our own individual ballots, but it's also about the ability to make elections free and fair in a way so that not just my vote gets counted, but everybody's vote can be counted in a meaningful way so that everybody has access to the political process. So thinking about the right to vote um, you know, is more than just, am I able to get to the polls and cast my own personal ballot? Okay, what do we vote for and what matters the most? Um, if, again, I feel like with a very sophisticated crowd, you all understand the importance of local elections, but the fact is the lower we get on this list, turnout drops off precipitously. And, um, you know, obviously presidential elections get the highest turnout, gubernatorial elections, those midterm elections are second. But the fact is, um, you know, local governments play incredibly important roles. They're delivering the services um, that have sort of our, our, our primary interactions every day, policing, fire, parks, education, you name it. And to have turnout where we have it is criminal. Um, I remember reading about a Schenectady school board election, I think in 2018 or 2019, um, right? Schenectady is, I think if you exclude New York City, one of the 10 largest school districts in the state. Um, it has a budget that is in the nine figures and 562 people voted in the entire election, right? That's all, that's very, very few people to decide the disposition uh, of that much money and the governance of a school district. Okay, this is an important point in, in, in determining what voter suppression is, right? Because voting is an individual cost benefit analysis. Um, this is a formula that comes out of political science. Uh, Riker and Ordeshuk uh, wrote an article about this. I think. I want to say back in the 60s, and they came up with this formula. Voting occurs when the reward an individual receives from voting uh, is greater than the differential benefit a voter receives when their preferred candidate wins, um, times the probability that a citizen will bring about that benefit, um, minus the cost an individual must pay to vote, right? So it's a cost-benefit analysis, and they broke it down probably a little more um, they excluded a few things that are benefits to voting that are more than just, is my candidate gonna win? Obviously people go vote because they want their candidates to win, but there is an expressive benefit to voting. Um, you know, there is a duty benefit to voting. I'm a citizen, I wanna um, you know, make sure that I'm being a good citizen and setting a good example. Um, but the fact is all of those benefits are difficult to quantify. And in the aggregate, they're fairly small when measured against the very, very high costs of voting. Um, voting in, in, in most senses is an economically irrational act. And so anything that is done to raise that cost is going to, um, exclude the marginal voter who can't afford that cost or for whom it, it, it no longer makes sense, who, who can't afford the expressive benefit, who can't afford the duty benefit. Right, so here are the different ways, excuse me, I was, this is a, a much younger audience I was writing for, um, right? So how could the right to vote to be infringed? We have vote suppression, which is also called vote denial, um, right? So we're raising the cost of voting by making it actually harder for individuals to get to the polls. We're raising the cost. We have vote dilution, which lowers the benefit, right? Vote dilution is, is gerrymandering, right? We're gonna rig the system in a way that your vote doesn't matter. Feel free to go vote all day. Um, it's not gonna make a difference. We've already foreordained the outcome. The outcome is foreordained. It diminishes the probability that your vote is gonna make a difference. And it also reduces that expressive and duty benefit. Election subversion. Um, hard to have a conversation about this. There are states where they have made an effort to allow state legislatures and secretaries of state to effectively overturn the will of the people. Um, hopefully we don't have to test that out, but that is arguably the most terrifying thing to come out of the recent spate of voter suppression laws. The idea that 
a state legislature can simply look at a result they don't like and say, you know what, we're going to throw it out. We feel like maybe there was fraud. Maybe there were irregularities we can't put our finger on. But because there's uncertainty, we're just going to impose our own will. Um, we've never encountered that before. Um, is the Electoral College a form of vote dilution? Excellent question. Yes, it is. It is absolutely a form of vote dilution. Uh, the United States Senate is a form of vote dilution in, in a slightly different way. But right, so um, right, the Electoral College changes the weight of people's votes, right? The, 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 the weight of a vote in California, I think, is about 1 64th that of a voter in Wyoming, which is insane. But that's what vote dilution does. It, um, it changes that calculus by watering down the California vote and, and, and overweighting the Wyoming vote. So excellent question. You are absolutely right. Um, okay, so this is, this is some sort of high concept look at what voter suppression and vote to those. Oh, um, how do you respond to someone who says my vote don't count? Okay, I love, I love these questions, keep them coming. Um, so in some sense, it depends what they mean, right? And, you know, when somebody says my vote doesn't count and what they mean is lots and lots of people are voting, my individual vote doesn't make a difference. Um, you know, the, the rejoinder to that is, you know, you don't know, first of all, you don't know that that's true. Um, the fact is, your vote might not be the deciding vote in a presidential election. It might not be the deciding vote in a gubernatorial election or other statewide election. Um, it might be the deciding vote in your city council election. It might be the deciding vote in your school board election. If 562 people are voting in a school board election, the odds that your vote makes a difference are actually really high. So the first thing is, I, I tell them, pay attention to all the elections because you'd be shocked at much uh, and how much not only your vote counts, but if you and 10 of your friends get together, all of a sudden you're a fairly powerful voting bloc. Um, so that's one way to do it. For, for the people um, who are more concerned about, um, you know, whether their vote is going to be thrown out, which is, you know, a concern that we have in New York State, right? Is my absentee ballot going to be rejected? Um, you know, is someone going to going to hack the election, right? There's different ways we can come at that. And, you know, I'm, I'm happy to sort of talk about the all the ways in which elections are actually fairly secure. Um, and, you know, all of these sort of technical things that go that go into whether a ballot gets counted or not, you know, you can be there if you cast a paper ballot at the canvas and make sure your ballot gets counted or take it to court um, and put it in front of a judge and overrule the Board of Elections. Um, so there's there are ways to get your vote counted if that's what you mean by that. Um, but in the end, the sort of like total rejoinder to everything is this is a democracy, even if your vote isn't gonna make the difference, right? This is what America is founded on. And it, it means so much for you to go vote. Um, and it's really, really hard to ask other people to go vote if you aren't willing to go do it yourself. Um, because even if your vote doesn't necessarily count in a way that it's going to cast the deciding ballot, the fact is your example might spur others and um, it makes it a stronger democracy. Every incremental person who votes, regardless of where it happens, regardless of how close the election is, uh, it just makes our democracy stronger. Uh, forgive me if that's hokey, but it happens to be how I feel. Um, okay, so this is actually, this, this, this slide in the political marketplace, this is actually how I describe um, how we investigate vote suppression and vote dilution to my law students. And what I ask them to think about is the idea of an electoral system as a political marketplace. Because the fact is we have lots and lots of moving parts in every electoral system, right? It's rarely as simple as vote denial being one particular thing that makes it hard to vote. It's usually a concatenation of factors that raise that cost in a way that just make voting too, too onerous for some people and they drop off because they have other priorities um, that, 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 that take precedence. So, um, you know, we think in general, is there fair competition in the political marketplace, 
right? Um, does it matter why or why not or questions I post to them for responses? You're welcome to respond to those um, if you want to. But I think here we're probably all in general agreement that, that fair competition matters. Um, who are the participants, right? And in terms of thinking who the participants are, you know, obviously we think about the voters, but we think about the candidates as well. We think about the parties. We think about the civic groups that are out there educating people, pounding the pavement to get people to turn out. Um, you know, there are so many different dimensions to the political marketplace. They have so many competing goals. They're so frequently in tension with each other. And the power imbalances between them um, can lead to, to voter suppression, right? Can lead to erecting barriers to entry into the political marketplace to exclude um, the actors that the dominant actors want to keep out. Okay, why suppress or dilute votes? Um, so the people who pass voter suppression laws are elected officials, they are incumbents. Um, they pass voter suppression laws because they want to remain in office. Um, they want to advantage the existing electorate. It's the existing electorate that put them in office and they want to disadvantage new voters. They want to keep out the people who did not put them in office. Uh, if they allow in a lot more people, it raises their cost of doing business. Okay. Okay. So voter suppression can occur at any point in the voting process, right? Um, it can occur in eligibility, right? So a form of voter suppression was saying that people who have felony convictions cannot vote until they have, you know, in Florida, it was not just completed their sentence, completed their parole, but paid off all their fines and fees. Even if they don't know what their fines and fees are, they're still ineligible to register to vote. That is a form of voter suppression. In New York, we didn't go quite that far. We just said that people couldn't vote even if they'd been released from prison, if they um, if they hadn't completed their parole yet. Um, luckily, or, or not luckily, thanks to a lot of hard work, uh, including from my colleagues at the League of Women Voters, um, we've changed that law. And now um, you can't vote if you're incarcerated, but if you're out, you vote. Um, registration. You can make registration easier or harder depending on um, how accessible voter registration forms are, right? If you have to go get a paper form at the Board of Elections, that makes life difficult. If you've got paper forms everywhere, that's better. If you're able to register to vote on your phone, that's even better. Um, we still require a wet ink signature on voter registration forms. That makes things difficult when you're in the middle of a pandemic and you don't want people coming in close contact because they may transmit um, a virulent disease. Um, so that remains a form of voter suppression. Uh, election dates. This is something I mentioned before. Um, obviously, we know we have primaries now. We have a consolidated primary in June. We have a general election day in November. Uh, it wasn't that long ago that we had federal primaries in June uh, and state primaries in September. Um, there was no reason for two primary days. It was just a form of voter suppression. Putting school district elections in May when nobody votes, village elections in March, special purpose districts in which really nobody votes. Like I cannot stress enough how much nobody votes in these special purpose district elections, even though these uh, entities have taxing authority um, is, really, um, is really troubling. But you can have an election occur at a time in which nobody wants to go. So that is actually something in which we have a lot of voter suppression in New York State. There are voters, um, in Nassau County, who I believe have five or six election days in any given year, um, which is nuts. Every additional time, you've got to go to the polls, wait online, go through the whole thing. Um, it's more cost. Voting hours, locations, and access, um, right? So locations, right? We just dealt with this in Rensselaer County. Um, they desperately did not want to make an early voting site accessible to minority voters in Troy. And so even though it's a county, um, oh, question from Barb. New York still has arcane rules for petitioners to get candidates on the ballot. Yes, we do. How do we change that? We'll get to that short answer, legislation. Um, 
So in, in Rensselaer County, right, we have our early voting law that says we have one early voting site for every full complement of 50,000 voters, um, right? You know that Rensselaer County, close by, has one city, it's Troy, and the Board of Elections decided they were not going to put an early voting site in Troy. Um, that is a way to suppress votes. If you are going to make polling places more convenient for the people who you think are likely to vote for the candidates you want and less convenient for the people who are not going to vote for the candidates you want, um, that, is, that is a form of voter suppression. Um, access is there, right? We have real problems with, with, with disabled access. I will say that I have not done nearly enough work um, to help fight for, for, for disability rights, but we've done more of it recently, especially as it comes to, to early voting. But if we're not putting early voting sites in places that are fully uh, accessible to disabled voters along public transit lines so that people can get there independently, um, you know, with, with um, disabled accessible transit, all of that matters. Um, voting hours, shorter voting hours means Harder to vote. If you got really, really long lines, um, you know, expanding hours will give people more opportunity to come at different times. It will mean shorter lines for the most part. Um, compressed voting hours, longer lines, more cost to voting. Uh, counting ballots. Uh, this was a fun thing I dealt with in 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 um, in the twenty twenty election when. Um, in the paper canvases, we have a process in New York by which uh, people can challenge the paper ballots, right? You can say that absentee ballot envelope, that signature doesn't match. They didn't complete the form right. Um, you know, I can't tell what the postmark says. Um, so I'm gonna challenge that, I'm gonna take it out of the canvas. Um, you know, and people were indiscriminately challenging ballots, uh, affidavit ballots, absentee ballots for no good reason at all. Um, and it's not easy for someone to just sit there during the paper ballot canvas and, and keep an eye on that. Um, so that can end up being a form of, of voter suppression as well, because it may lead to ballots getting tossed by, by eligible voters. Um, there's a note, first generation barriers, right? First generation barriers is a term that we use in the voting rights field to refer to vote denial. Um, second generation barriers, our vote dilution, the more subtle and sophisticated forms that said, you know, let the people vote, let the people go to the polls and do whatever they want. We'll just rig things um, so that their votes won't count. Okay. What are examples of voter suppression and how do they work? Oh, that's a good slide. I'm glad I did that. Um, oh, I guess I put that out there to the class rather than list them. God, I was so excited. I was hoping I'd done that homework and already put them all out there. But you heard me mention a bunch of them, right? We're talking about voter registration, the 25 voter, uh, day voter registration cutoff is one. Um, you know, the, the uh, misplacement of absentee ballots, the refusal of some boards of elections, generally one commissioner to put absentee uh, early voting sites on college campuses, the lack of an online voter registration system, the ability of candidates to indiscriminately challenge them. Again, all of these things raise the cost of voting. And sound like a broken record when it comes to that, um, but that's what we deal with. Okay, this is a little bit out of left field, um, but you know, how do we litigate voter suppression cases? Um, this is about racial voter suppression cases. In general, we, we, we litigate voter suppression cases using a framework called the Anderson Burdick framework, if I can be technical for a second, which just looks at the balancing between, you know, um, how, how burdensome is this regulation? How many people is it disenfranchising against what's the administrative need for it? How important is it to the state? What is the rationale behind, um, behind a particular rule, right? So if someone says, we need a strict voter ID law because there's fraud, well, okay, the strict voter ID rule may keep, you know, 20,000 seniors from the polls because they no longer have photo ID because they don't drive anymore. It may disenfranchise uh, 30,000 city dwellers who don't drive because they live in an area of public transportation. Um, on the other hand, there may be, you know, one case of documented in-person voter fraud in the past 30 years. 
a good faith analysis of that cost benefit suggests that that strict voter ID shouldn't stand. Um, the Supreme Court has been really, really forgiving of, um, of, 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 of citing fraud as a justification for all kinds of racial voter suppression. The lovely little emoji that I put after Brnovich um, is a recognition of that. Samuel Alito, in his majority opinion, basically said, fraud is a strong and legitimate justification. And uh, the implication is it doesn't even necessarily matter whether there's actual fraud. Um, you know, as long as there's even a potential for fraud, um, you can place all kinds of restrictions on the right to vote. Is voter, okay, so a question from Patricia. Is voter deception a form of suppression or an evil unto itself? Um, boy, so voter deception is definitely a form of suppression. Um, evil, sure, I'll buy that. Yeah, I think, I think telling voters the wrong information intentionally to get them to not vote or to get them to cast their ballot in a way that's gonna get thrown out. Yeah, I, I think that is a violation of people's civil rights. Um, I, I, I think there's, I think it can be criminally prosecuted to be frank, um, but it's certainly, it's certainly a, um, a violation of, of, of the Voting Rights Act. Uh, and there are provisions of the New York Voting Rights Act, the bill that Senator Myrie and Assemblywoman Walker uh, have, have, have sponsored uh, that would actually make that specifically actionable. So yes, that is a form of suppression and it's terrible. Um, okay, vote dilution. I don't know that I need to get into sort of the whole um, everything, everything about racial vote dilution um, because it's pretty exhausting. Um, Oh yeah, now we're really getting into the weeds and I don't wanna make your lives that unpleasant. Um, okay, so, so one thing I will mention here is, is this particular slide, right? Why, why does voting rights enforcement matter? And again, this, this focuses on, um, on voting rights from a from a racial perspective, and again, I, I focus on a, on on racial vote suppression and vote dilution because it is the most common and pernicious form of, of, of vote dilution and vote suppression. Right? There's no question that there are simply laws out there that make it hard to vote, and we should get at those. Those are bad. Um, we should go the extra measure to strike down the laws that are really targeting and disabling the political efficacy of specific marginalized groups. And um, racial minorities have been the target of those things in particular. And, and, and how does it work? What is the sort of vicious cycle, um, right? So when you effectively suppress or dilute minority votes, communities of color are unable to elect their candidates of choice. Um, when they're unable to elect their candidates of choice, the people who do get elected tend not to respond to minority needs. Um, public policy will continue to make um, barriers for those minority communities to build political power. All you have to do is look at Texas, um, right? The more, the more efforts there are to suppress minority votes, the more policy is out there making it harder to be Black or Latino um, or Asian in, in, in Texas or Native American for that matter. Um, and so that continued inequity the feeling of political efficacy, uh, political inefficacy discourages the participation necessary to organize. So if you feel like your vote doesn't count, um, as, as Linda so aptly phrased it earlier, you are more likely to drop out of the, the political ecosystem altogether um, and not necessarily re-enter. And that is gonna keep this cycle rolling. Um, and gonna keep, again, this applies to communities of color, but you can really apply it to any sort of discrete and insular um, group that can be marginalized. So that's why voting rights enforcement matters is, you know, we wanna make better public policy. We want to make inclusive public policy. We don't want people to be left behind. We want everyone to have a voice. Um, and, that's, and that's ultimately the goal, right? I mean, obviously it's important to make sure that 
voting matters and that people are able to cast that ballot and feel like a part of the system, but actually generating good public policy, the ability to hold elected officials accountable um, is, is, is really the end game of a functioning democracy. Okay, how do we fight it? I think this was sort of like a technical discussion. Oh, different forms for advocacy. This is good because this always gets into the league, right? So I spend a lot of my time litigating and I'm happy to talk about um, cases if you have questions about cases. Um, we legislate, right? We get, we get into Albany and we as groups, as coalitions like the Let New York Vote Coalition, uh, the Voting Rights Consortium, which is another good group, the league itself, NICLU itself, right? We go into legislators' offices, we grab them off the floor, and we, we, we do everything we can. Um, luckily in New York, that tends to work. Um, by the way, if you haven't had a chance to go to Albany and do that in-person lobbying, um, I really, really highly recommend it. It is tons of fun. Um, administrative, go to the Board of Elections, right? If the polling place scheme for your community is not particularly good, and there are communities that could be better served with a more convenient early voting site or more or more uh, early voting hours, um, more voter education, right? Because the Board of Elections puts out notices and things like that. Um, you can demand commissioners meetings. Uh, New York City is the only place I'm aware of where the commissioners actually hold regular weekly public meetings where they tell everybody about what's going on and the public can then address them and ask questions and, and make comments. Um, everyone is entitled to that. Uh, you should feel free to lobby your board of elections. So that administrative advocacy, I think, is really overlooked, but potentially really good. Um, communications, right? We write op-eds. We use social media. We hold events like this, candidate forums, which the league is so great at. Um, but again, the more we communicate with the public, the better off we are. And then again, organizing is, is what matters so much. And so to answer Amy's question, will the defeat of the two amendments to the state constitution set back expansion of voter enfranchisement in New York state? What can be done to, to achieve further expansion? Organizing, Amy, organizing will achieve further expansion. So to answer the first question, will the defeat set back expansion? Yes, temporarily. Um, we could have had same day registration as early as these upcoming elections in 2022, it's not gonna happen now. What will probably happen instead is you will see the constitutional amendment resolution pass um, for the first time in 2022. I think they will then have learned their lesson and they will skip 2023 and they will pass it for the second time in 2024, which means it will go to the ballot in a presidential election year when turnout is highest and um, you know, we're not going to see the same kind of ambush that we saw uh, this year when when the when the measure failed. So, um, in the end, what can be done to achieve further expansion? So many things, right? So, I'm, I'm happy to go through like a laundry list of all of the different policy um, proposals, right? Obviously, same day registration, no excuse absentee, are all the way at the top right now. By the way. If the registration deadline were shortened from 25 days to 10 days, we would have one day of same day registration during early voting. Um, you could lengthen early voting out and then you'd have like a golden week when same day registration is available. You could do that immediately for 2022. I think that would achieve uh, a lot of benefit. Um, when it comes to automatic voter registration, that's being implemented for 2023. Lobby the governor, have more agencies added to automatic voter registrations. There's a lot of different avenues to get people registered to vote. Um, pass the New York Voting Rights Act, right? There's a lot of really interesting wonky provisions, the New York Voting Rights Act. Um, one of my favorites though, is it creates a statewide election database that pulls in all kinds of really important data and information from every election jurisdiction in the states. The boards of elections, but also the school districts, the villages, everybody. And it allows us to study how people and register and vote and make evidence-based public policy, which is really, really what we want. We are tired of sort of throwing darts in the dark. Like let's make enlightened public policy. Um, I, I would be remiss if I didn't mention 
my friend Jared Berg's biggest bugaboo of all, which he's absolutely right about, which is the uh, the out of precinct voting. You might have heard wrong church, right? So if you go to the wrong polling place and you cast a ballot, your ballot gets thrown out in its entirety. Um, there's no need for that. If you go to the wrong polling place, you might very well be casting votes for offices for which you are entitled to vote, right? If you are in Saratoga County and you accidentally go to a polling place, I don't know why you would, but let's say you go to a polling place in Albany County next year, but you happen to vote for governor, there's no reason your vote for governor shouldn't count, um, right? You're still entitled to vote for governor, even if you're in an altogether wrong place. So those are a few things. Um, I'm working off the top of my head on that one, but um, happy to answer questions about more things. Can you give us hope from Patricia that in the newly suppressed states, there are advocacy groups working 24 seven to help voters get around the barriers? Yes, <laughs> yes, I can, um, right? I mean, I so the ACLU, I'll, I'll certainly speak for us. The ACLU has affiliates in every state in the union. Um, and I know those folks are out there you know, busting it every day to organize um, and get people past these barriers. We've got the Voting Rights Project in in New York, um, of which I am a I am a member. Occasionally, I, I engage in work outside the state. Um, you know, and we 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 tackle the barriers through litigation. But there's also fabulous groups on the ground. Um, you know, whether it's um, Black Voters Matter movement, Unidos US. Mi Familia Vota, um, you know, Asians American Advancing Jobs. I mean, there's a lot of groups out there which are really um, doing the organizing because ultimately nothing is effective without organizing. So yes, 24 seven, spread the vote, right? Spread the vote is out there working to get people voter IDs in states in which there are voter ID requirements. Um, so yeah, folks, folks working hard. Um, Sherry, on the defeated amendment of changing, not having a reason for getting an absentee ballot, I don't understand why this didn't pass. It seemed like such a no-brainer. Why was it determined to be defeated? Sherry, it's likely you're, you're living in my head here. Um, so I'm happy to talk about why, why it was defeated. Um, it's not because it's not a good idea. It's not because it's not popular. It's because odd year elections are a pernicious form of voter suppression. They are a terrible idea and nobody voted, right? Everybody took these, these, these common sense democracy measures for granted. And so the side in favor of them didn't organize. But the side that was against them was perfectly happy to spread all kinds of disinformation about how oh, same day registration, no excuse absentee ballot are gonna undermine election security. How the hell, excuse me, how are they gonna do that? Um, there's, no, there's no evidence to what they're saying. They're just fear mongering. Um, so, you know, one side went out and spent millions and millions of dollars and pounded the pavement really hard. And the other side took it for granted. Um, you know, there also just weren't that many elections out there. If you did this in a presidential election year, like 2024, for example, or even in a midterm year, like 2022, you would have more voter awareness because there's more elections going on. You would have um, more groups out there organizing. You would probably have more of a coordinated campaign that gets at those ballot measures. Um, so it wasn't defeated because it was politically unpopular, right? Public opinion polls show both same day registration, no excuse absentee are favored by majority, by both by majorities of New Yorkers. Um, this, this was about organizing. And you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not gonna point fingers at individuals or, or, or groups. I will happily take some blame on myself. I did not get out and pound the pavement as much as I should have to get those things passed. But um, anyway, we can get those passed. We will get those passed. Um, we're just not going to get blindsided again. And hopefully we're not going to make this, the mistake of putting it on the ballot in an odd year. And frankly, we should end odd year elections. There's absolutely no good reason for them. They waste time. They waste taxpayer money. They are low turnout. Um, what is the point of elections in which nobody votes? Okay. 
Amy, please repeat info about database legislation. Okay, well, now you're just inviting me to talk about my favorite piece of legislation in the world. So I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it in a fulsome way. And you're welcome to stop me or shut off the Zoom or whatever. But this is one of the things that makes me happiest. So um, you'll have to you have to grab me a little leeway. So um, the John R. Lewis Voting Rights Act of New York came around when I was sitting in a hearing in New York City, a joint assembly and um, Senate hearing on the elections committees about early voting. And I was complaining about our friends in Rensselaer County who were doing not such good things even then. And Senator Myrie asks, wouldn't pre-clearance in New York go a long way towards fixing these problems? And I said, Senator Myrie, that's, that's certainly true. But wouldn't it be great to have that as part of a comprehensive Voting Rights Act? And Senator Myrie was kind enough to stop me afterwards and says, that's exactly what I had in mind. And so with some colleagues, we got to work drafting the nation's strongest and most comprehensive State Voting Rights Act. So I'm just going to quickly tell you about all the provisions and then focus on the, on the database for a second. I think the database is actually the really underappreciated gem of the law. Um, so the first thing the law does, and it's a law that is genuinely focused on, on racial equity, but there are parts of it that are really focused on boosting up all voters and just strengthening our democracy in general. So the first provision of the law is adding a democracy canon to, um, to New York elections. The democracy canon basically says when courts are interpreting the election law, we put a thumb on the side of the voters, right? We put a thumb on the side of getting that vote counted, of getting that candidate um, on the ballot, making sure those signatures, if they're close, get counted. It is always saying in favor of the more expansively democratic outcome. Now, it's not saying that the voter always wins, that the candidate always gets on the ballot, um, but it, 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 again, puts a thumb on the scale there so that we are making sure that eligible voters get uh, eligible voters are able to have their ballots counted, and that you know eligible voters who sign petitions are able to have their signatures counted and, and things like that. Um, the second section of the law are improvements over the vote suppression and vote dilution causes of action we have um, in federal law. Right, the Supreme Court has really dialed back the efficacy of the Federal Voting Rights Act. The California Voting Rights Act is really the progenitor of all of this. It was um, written by a wonderful lawyer, the late Joaquin Avila. Um, and that made it easier for particularly uh, Latino voters in California to challenge at-large elections, which you know were squeezing them out of any political power at all. You would have a really large percentage of, of cities and school districts in California where, where Latinos made up a large percentage of the population, but because you had racially polarized voting, you know, you would have a five member city council in a place that's 51% white, 49% Latino, um, and you have an all white city council because the at-large election enables that. So that's where the problem Avila was addressing. We learned some of the lessons from that law and we pull it over to New York where we have some of the same problems with minority vote dilution in at-large elections. We apply it to um, uh, districted elections as well. Um, we also deal with election timing, right? Well, that, that, that issue where we have those off-cycle elections in which nobody votes, um, and which particularly suppress minority turnouts. Um, so that's, that's a litigation thing. Hopefully um, you won't personally have to deal with that, but... Um, Call me if there are vote dilution problems in, in, in Saratoga County. Um, there are expanded language access provisions. So right now, federal law has a fairly high threshold for when a jurisdiction is required to provide language assistance to voters. Um, this lowers that threshold. So in New York, we're providing language assistance to more groups of voters in each space. Right now, there actually isn't much language assistance required out of New York, outside of New York City. Um, Nassau and Suffolk are required to provide information in Spanish. So is Westchester. Um, beyond that, there's sort of scattershot provision, but obviously we have growing language minority communities around the state um, and they deserve more protection. So that works on that. And then we get to the database. Uh, so 
right now, if you wanted to study New York elections, it'd be really, really hard. If you wanted to look at, say, voter turnout, and you wanted to get voter files, um, you know, if you want to look at voter turnout in school district elections, you would have to FOIL 675 separate school districts. If you wanted to learn more about turnout in village elections, you might have to FOIL hundreds of villages. Um, you know, if you want to know the shape files um, for the precincts in every in every county, um, you would have to go FOIL at least 58 boards of elections. Rather than making voters go through all that work, or making scholars go through all that work, or even making legislators go through all that work, we are going to centralize all of that really important information that we need to study in order to know how to build better elections in a database that is gonna be housed in our public universities. It'll be a joint enterprise of SUNY and CUNY. It is going to be, um, I mean, just an absolute treasure trove for election scholarship. For policymaking, we are going to have uh, voting rights fellows, undergraduates, as well as graduate students who specifically learn how to work with the data. Um, and frankly, it's it should be a boon to the jurisdictions, which will have to deal with fewer FOIL requests because they're just going to send this stuff automatically to the database. Um, and then that database is also going to do some internal analyses, which give us more information to evaluate you know, whether redistricting plans are fair, um, you know, whether um, early voting schemes are serving populations well, whether um, populations that are entitled to language assistance are, are, are getting it, right? That's not an easy thing uh, to do. It requires sophisticated work with census data. And so we want somebody who's always looking out um, to make sure we are using data to drive our decision making, that we're using evidence to drive our decision making, and not just sort of a gut feeling about how the political process works. Um, there is, as Senator Myrie suggested, a preclearance provision in the bill. So covered counties, counties that have um, either a history of discrimination in voting or civil rights generally, um, or have high levels of housing segregation, or high disparities in um, in criminal justice issues, uh, arrest data in particular, um, would be subject to preclearance. And so they would have to make sure that changes to their election laws are pre-cleared through either the Attorney General's Office, the Civil Rights Bureau, or through uh, a court in their judicial department. Um, if folks are skeptical about the Attorney General, they're entitled to go to the court instead. Um, the Attorney General is gonna provide a more efficient process, um, but again, we don't, we, don't, we don't want people, we don't want boards of elections and jurisdictions to be limited in their option there. Um, so we provide um, both avenues. And they just have to show that any changes to their election laws and practices are not making minority voters worse off. It's the non-retrogression standard um, that was applied in section five for you know, 48 years until it was struck down. So uh, it's a familiar standard. It's one that everyone should be um, able to, to able to implement. And um, you know, it's going to hopefully put election administrators in a mindset of equity when they are making changes so that we're always moving forward in terms of how do we make a fairer election system? If we're going to move polling places, if we're going to expand early voting now, if we're going to, you know, um, stop issuing certain notices or start issuing other notices, um, that we're really thinking about who's this going to impact and, and, and how much. Uh, there is also a provision on it um, which gets at voter intimidation, voter deception, which is uh, unfortunately increasingly prevalent. These robocalls that say things like, you know, Democrats vote on Tuesday, Republicans vote on Wednesday. Um, it's rarely that way around, but I'm just giving you an example. Um, you know, for voter obstruction, we've unfortunately seen things like car caravans blocking access to early voting sites. And there need to be remedies to make sure that voters are not um, obstructed out of getting to the polls in a timely way and um, that there are opportunities 
for either more voting hours or more voting locations to make sure that people who want to obstruct and misinform and intimidate um, aren't able to succeed. Uh, Linda remarks, it's difficult to counter misinformation when it's on social media. Uh, well, ain't that the truth? <laughs> um, that's, I mean, it's just absolutely right. And so, you know, when it comes to misinformation, you know, some of it, we just, we just counter it with as much truthful speech as humanly possible, but also we do our best to make the voting laws and the voting opportunities as forgiving as possible so that um, there's a margin for error um, and that misinformation doesn't necessarily disenfranchise quite as often as it could. Okay, let me just take a look at the last of my slides here. Um, oh, good, fighting voting rights abuses. Um, you know, I give I give people all kinds of lists, and again, I did this I did this for law students. So you may or may not be making TikTok videos and publishing law notes, but honestly, if you do, like more power to you. I I can't use TikTok, um, and I don't have the stamina to do Twitter threads. But if you can, you know, bless you. Um, you know, obviously, you can always start um, at home with the most basic thing. Make sure your registration is current and that you're ready to vote. Um, I know who I'm talking to here. I'm sure all of your registrations are current anyway, but you never know when the BOE is gonna screw it up. So just check. Um, make sure your family do the same. Participate in voter registration, voter education, and get out the vote. That's all of you, so fantastic. Um, visit, write, call, email, text, and use social media to lobby elected officials. This is the thing I think more people should do. And that maybe, I don't know how often you all do it, but I find it really rewarding every time I do it. Because the fact is when you're dealing with state elected officials, they just don't get that much traffic. And so every individual contact really does make a difference. And when you do it as an organized group, um, you can make a ton of change. I mean, there's 21 participants right now on this Zoom. If you had 20 people, you know, put in calls to a legislator's office, they are gonna understand that that is a serious issue. If you have 20 people sitting next to the assembly chamber doing off the floors, and by the way, if you've never done off the floors, you really should do it. It's a lot of fun. Um, you know, you write, you take out your business card or your calling card or whatever, you write the name of an elected official on there, you hand it to the sergeant of arms, the sergeant of arms goes down and finds that elected official. A few minutes later, they come out and they say, okay, what do you wanna talk about? What is more fun than that? Um, so lobby, strongly recommend it. Uh, attend and speak at public hearings, well, right? You have a right to, to, to have your voice heard. Um, you don't have to write anything, right? You don't have to give 20 minutes of testimony. Two minutes of testimony is great. Um, and by the way, that's not just state legislative hearings. That can be city council hearings, board of elections meetings, uh, you can force Board of Elections meetings if they're not having any, um, school board meetings. So I'm just, I'm a big, big proponent of anybody getting in front of elected officials and making their voices heard. Um, run for office. Um, I hope some of you have thought about it. Certainly you've got the infrastructure for it. Um, encourage the others around you to do it. Um, it's easier than you think. I mean, it's also harder than you think, um, but it's important. It's important for engaged people who care about their communities to run for office um, and not to be too overwhelmed by the thought of it. Uh, research conditions on the ground and, and places of interest to you. You know, look, I, this is more for me, right? I, I am, as far as I know, the only voting rights lawyer who represents individual voters and, and voter organizations in the public interest whose practice is wholly contained within the state of New York. Uh, my ability to pay attention to everything all the time is, is fairly limited, especially now that I, I have to drop off a baby at daycare and pick him up every day um, and, and he's sleep training. So I'm, I'm a little more tired than I used to. So I, I really, really appreciate it when people are able to tell me what's going on, where they are. And sometimes it's, Listen, there's a great thing we're doing in Saratoga County. You should know about it because you might want to see other boards of elections do it. Or it might be, here's an awful thing that's going on in Saratoga County, which you probably don't know about because you may or may not have the local papers here. 
you may or may not be at these local meetings. Um, so that, that's important stuff as well. Um, work for organizations that do voting rights litigation. I'm revising that. Um, you all are volunteering for an organization that does voting rights work. So you're all covered there. Uh, keep informed. I, I appreciate you inviting me, but being a resource to others, again, I think that's so, it's the, just the best function of the league is you keep others informed. And, and yeah, get out there and, 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 and publish. Send letters to the editor, you know, get on social. If people are giving misinformation, you give truthful information. I just think there's, there's so many different things that, that, that you can do. Uh, yeah, that is exactly what I think. Anything and everything helps. And I'm gonna leave you with John Lewis because he's, you know, my absolute hero. Um, I had the good fortune to meet him a couple of times, including right after the Shelby County argument. And I've never seen him so mad in my whole life is after he sat in there and Justice Scalia called the Voting Rights Act, which he literally bled for on the Edmund Pettus Bridge, a racial entitlement. Um, but we're gonna, we're gonna honor his legacy and we're gonna fight this bill into existence. Barb, I did not miss your question. Uh, I've observed that voter participation is very low in off year elections. Me too. Uh, especially where there is no choice. Boy, I, sometimes, by the way, when there is a choice, just when it isn't going to be close. For example, I live in New York City and we had a mayoral election. And, you know, there were multiple candidates on the ballot, but like nobody had any illusions. Um, how do we change that? That's such a good question. Um, I think for some of these local elections, uh, we may need to have a constitutional amendment. I was actually looking at this earlier. I had, I had looked it up, but we change it by legislation, you know? So we go find the constitutional provision that puts local elections in odd years. And we do the same thing we did with same day registration and, and no excuse absentee. And frankly, I think it is less controversial to move uh, local elections from odd years to even years, because there's no compelling reason to keep them in odd years. They're just low turnout. Um, they're just extra expense to the taxpayers. There's no special focus, right? There's nothing. It's not like we have our local elections all by themselves, and that year ends up being a festival of local civic participation. It's not. Nobody shows up. So I think we've got. I think we've got a lot to do. Um, to move odd year elections to the dustbin of history. And I think we can do it. Um, I'm happy to go back and see if I can find the exact constitutional provision, but, but rest assured that that is going to be a, a, a focus of mine um, is getting those things um, ended. Uh, the bill number for the J.R. Lewis, uh, John R. Lewis Voting Rights Act of New York, it is A6678A and S1046A. I will put it in the chat. Ah, uh, Patricia, in your voting district, only one party was on the ballot for every position. I mean, I'm, I'm with you. <laughs> I mean, that look, that happens. There's a lot of places in New York where the geography is frankly such that the, the, the primary election is where all the action is. Um, I live in the Bronx. Um, no Republican, no, no one in any party that I'm aware of other than the Democratic Party has been a meaningful candidate for any office in this borough for my entire life. Um, but the primaries, there's a ton of action there. Um, so it's really, really important to, to, to be vigilant then. So um, there was another point I was gonna make about, oh, the thing that I find really obnoxious is judicial elections. If I could just go off for, the, uh, uh, for this in a second. Um, we have an awful system of electing trial court judges. We have judicial nominating conventions, right? So the, the party bosses 
will pick a bunch of people they think are reliable. They'll give them their nominees to the judges, the judicial delegates will generally run without competition. They will rubber stamp the nominees of the party in a convention. And then in November, right, there are some places where you've got partisan balance and in November, um, maybe you'll see a contest between party nominees. But in some counties, even competitive counties, like Nassau and Suffolk, the parties get together, shake hands, divvy up the seats, and nobody is contested, right? You will see judges there endorsed by every single party. Um, the ostensible justification is, oh, well, we don't want anyone to go through the rigors of an election. We don't want to reduce our judges to that. Well, how are we vetting these judges? We're letting the party bosses just pick them, which is, which is nonsense. When the, when the New York State system of challenging judicial elections, uh, sorry, when the New York State system of electing trial court judges was brought to the Supreme Court after it was struck down by the Southern District of New York in the Second Circuit, including then Judge Sotomayor, the Supreme Court said, yeah, it's not unconstitutional, but Justice Stevens in his concurrence said, it's a bad system, but the constitution, quote, does not prevent states from making stupid laws. We should not have a judicial system where the best thing that Justice Stevens can say about it is it's a stupid law. We can do better. We should focus on doing better. So judicial election reform is, is another thing that's on my list and really sticks in my craw, but it's an extremely complicated topic and I, I'm still waiting my way through it. Um, so that's that's what I've got. Um, if there are any other questions, I would be I would be delighted to answer them. I've, I've you've had great questions so far, um, and and this really is a, a ton of fun for me. I'm, I hope you all are having as much fun as I am sitting there. If anybody wants to, they can just ask a question and not type it into the chat. I'm sure we have some people who are anxious to. Uh go back and forth maybe on something. It does seem to me that not that having election day on a work day is a form of voter suppression. How has that continued this long? And what, if anything, is being done to change that? So let me let me push back on that idea a little bit. Um, I, I tend to shy away from the idea that election day should be a holiday and more in, in favor of we should just have more opportunities to vote, right? Let's expand early voting because the problem is if election day is a holiday, the people who are able to take off holidays, like great for them. The problem is it is the lowest wage workers who are disproportionately people of color who are not going to be able to take that day off. So they are going to benefit the least. Um, I think the idea of making sure that everybody has paid time off to vote is a good idea, but even that is not necessarily going to trickle down to people with bad employers. And so I think in order to make voting, I mean, don't get me wrong, I'm not hostile to the idea of making election day a holiday, but I think if you want to make voting more inclusive, more voting times, more voting days, right? Harris County, Texas, um, I think runs elections really, really well. Not with, in fact, they run elections so well, the state of Texas passes laws to try and stop what they're doing specifically. So one of the things they did in the last election is they instituted drive-through voting, um, right, for the pandemic. They have curbside voting um, for disabled voters. Um, they had 24-hour voting for a couple of days. Now, not every place needs 24 hour voting. Um, and, you know, but, but drive through voting for rural areas, could that be a helpful thing? Curbside voting, is that a really good alternative when you maybe don't necessarily have the best polling places in terms of accessibility? So I think there's, I think the more we can do to expand those voting opportunities, the more we're going to get the, the desired benefit. Um, of making of making voting more accessible, which I think is the intention behind making election day a holiday. Um, the, the other, I mean, the other thing that making election day a holiday 
does, and I think it's a holiday here in, in, or at least a school holiday in New York City, is it allows you to use the, the, the schools as bowling places in an unfettered way, um, which is good, right? You have a lot of traffic and why, you know, just makes life easier if you have students bustling through the halls. Um, but, you know, I think, the, I think the marginal benefit is questionable. What would what has been in terms of you know the the study that you've done on this the most effective uh, option beyond I mean you've you've mentioned the drive through voting I'm not sure how they got enough volunteers to cover that but um, I you know especially when they're all working um, but you know what is it that you think would be most effective for New York to do is it is it absentee mail in vote is it adding more um, early voting poll places and dates? It's same day registration. It's, 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 not, even, it's not even close, right? I mean, um, you, could, you could go to, you know, an all male election like Oregon or Colorado does. That's a pretty, that's a pretty high turnout system. Um, I don't have a problem with that, but it's not my favorite. Um, my my favorite is is no excuse absentee with really expansive in person voting. I think that is the most inclusive. But if you want the one intervention that is the single most effective thing, there is no question that it's same day registration. Um, and 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 it, intuitively, it should make sense because people start paying attention to an election the closer you get to election day. There's more media coverage, right? This is, and this is, by the way, this is a, a focal point of our lawsuit against the registration deadline is 25 days out, you haven't had any candidate forms. Nobody knows who's running. Nobody is out spending money on commercials. Nobody's knocking on doors four weeks out from an election. Same day registration, people are going to show up at the polls because they've heard things on election day. And so, that it's it's just it's so obnoxious that it failed because it is it is effective everywhere it happens and it will be effective when it gets to New York State. It's just unfortunately going to be 2024, 2025. Thank you. Carrie, um, I'm a poll worker and uh, this last election, um, I was in a school, an elementary school, and I would say overall, we had less parents coming in with kids than we have had in the past. So I think it kind of goes to what you're saying, even when you make it easier, for some reason, then people don't come in. So it used to be that, you know, parents were coming in to pick up their kids or, you know, they had to drop something off, they would come in and they would vote or they would stay after with the kids and vote. This year, we saw very, very few parents with kids walking in hmm. and there was no school that day. So I, you know, I, to me, I saw less people vote in that age bracket. And I, I don't have any way to substantiate that because I'm not privy to any databases, but, um, but it just seemed like less of that age bracket were voting because they weren't coming to school already. Yeah, I think, I mean, that makes sense, right? The idea that if you're gonna to go to school anyway and you're gonna show up, might as well vote while you're there. So I, I, I don't think that's, um, I realize you're drawing conclusions based on anecdotes, but I don't think it's wrong. Um, so it's, I mean, first of all, thank you for being a poll worker, right? Like I can't say enough about like how important it is to be poll worker and, and how, unfortunate and obnoxious it is that people have, you know, really taken shots at our election administrators, um, unfortunately, both verbally and physically at times. Um, but it's such an important job to make people feel, feel welcome at the polls, you know? Uh, voting, voting is a habit. And if you have a bad experience, it's gonna be hard to form that habit. So, you know, kudos, kudos to you. And I, I hope everyone does it at some point. Um, you know, we want to put polling places in convenient locations, right? We want to put polling places where people are going to go vote. Um, there was a lot of kerfuffle in New York City about putting early voting sites in schools. 
Um, I, I frankly am not that concerned about it. I don't think it's a safety risk. I've actually never heard of any child being harmed ever because there was voting in a school while school was going on. Um, and it does make for, for more civic participation. I think it really does introduce more children and families to, to the political process, right? It's not like we just let people wander the halls of schools because it happens to be election day. I mean, anyway, so, so I, think, I think it's just another place where sort of fear mongering tends to enter um, our, our, our political process. And, and I, I think having voting in and around schools is generally speaking a good idea. Um, when and when and when school is going on because you want people again it lowers the cost of voting if you're going to school anyway to drop off your kid or pick up your kid um it's easy to just go two rooms over and go vote and frankly when i was a kid i, I don't know if anyone else has these memories i loved going to vote right i went with my parents they took me it was really one of the things that cemented my love of democracy and you know if you're taking your child to school anyway Spend an extra 10 minutes, go with your, go with your parents to go vote, see the ballot, you know, see the whole process, have a poll worker smile at you, you know, like that to me, that's a way to create a good experience that's going to build lifelong habits. So anyway, that was probably more than, than you, than you asked for, but I, I have, I have feelings about things I tend to share. Quincy asked a question on the oh, chat. I don't know if you got to that or not. Do the oh, states sorry, I see it. Uh, do the states that have no excuse absentee voting spend less than states that have in-person or mixed? Um, Quincy, when you say no excuse absentee, do you mean uh, elections that are entirely by mail when you say that as opposed to mixed? Uh, yes. It's not clear to me that they spend less. I, I actually don't know the the cost breakdown. They do tend to have higher turnout. Um, they're also relatively less dense states where it's not as easy to offer quite as much convenient in-person voting, right? So we're talking about Colorado, Oregon, Utah. Um, I can't remember what the other one is, but um, you know, I think I think in general you. I think you have to provide robust in-person voting in New York under any circumstances. Until a couple of years ago, the only way almost every person in the state of New York had ever voted was in person on election day, right? Like a few people voted absentee every year, but not many, right? Like, like we rarely cracked like 5% and we had no early voting. I think to go from, um, an entirely impersonal election day system to an all mail system is is probably not a good idea for no us. no I no, agree no, no, I'm not suggesting that you're saying that but I think the mixed states the ones that offer good accessible in person voting and allow for no excuse absentee end up having the best outcomes and you know in terms of the cost I think. I don't, I don't want to go ahead and say like, you should just spend whatever on elections. Like you do have to have some sense of fiscal responsibility, but nobody is breaking the bank and offering a good election system. Elections are in, 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 you know, among the things we spend money on, it's not the, the item that's breaking the bank. I just, I personally find that um, I voted absentee. Um, because of COVID. Mm -hmm. And I also, the year before we had COVID, I was an election uh, inspector. Okay. And I personally found voting absentee um, where if I had a question about a candidate, I could look it up. Yeah. Um, made a tremendous amount of sense. Um, no weather issues, no health issues. Um, so I'm like, yes, New York State, let's get this on. Plus, we spend a lot of money on um, election poll workers. 
Yeah, so so I will agree 100% on the virtues of, of voting by mail, right? I think being able to vote from the comfort of your kitchen, being able to look up candidates, you know, if you want to, if you want to talk to somebody voluntarily, you're welcome to do. I mean, I, I think I think voting in the in the environment that is most comfortable for you, independently, privately, is is excellent. Um, there are, of course, some people for whom remote voting is not possible, um, and so you know we've got to be, be 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 mindful of that. But I think in general, it's a great option for those who can use it. And when we go to no excuse absentee. We can have a permanent absentee list, right? You can sign up instead of applying every year. You can say, just send me my ballot for every election. And that would be great. Yeah, that, I, I agree. And it would also make the lives easier for the election administrators who don't have to receive absentee ballot applications. They can just say, you know, I know that every year, 20% of my voters, I'm sending them absentee ballots on day one and they'll return them when they're ready to return them. And that's going to make um, election administration much easier. But in-person voting is, is really valuable um, because it reaches a lot of people who are not familiar with absentee voting, aren't necessarily comfortable with absentee voting, um, or, or prefer the social aspect of voting in person, right? I mean, um, you may be familiar with, with Souls to the Polls, right? So on Sundays during early voting, um, Black churches after services would go vote together. Um, that is a model. Right, and not just a model because it's a it's a great civil rights story, but there's there's also studies that show when you throw a party next to a polling place, it increases turnout, right? And that makes sense. When voting is fun, more people are going to want to do it. When voting is a social activity that you sort of celebrate with your neighbors, it's it's a draw. So I would like to see voting in person available because it provides those benefits that are different from what you get from absentee voting. But it's why I love a mixed system because you've identified all of those incomparable benefits of voting by mail that some people are gonna to want to avail themselves of. And I think choice is good. And, and so let's have a mixed system. And in New York State, one of the problems with um, absentee balloting is that your vote can be challenged whereas once it's entered on the machine i mean even though it's a paper ballot and you can um audit the paper ballots it's not subject to challenge that's so that's a really good point i i had sort of a, just a, a fun introduction of the paper ballot canvas back in back in uh in november 2020 um actually sat uh, in several days of the Ulster County canvas and just watched some election lawyers just pull out a lot of really nonsense objections um, to a bunch of ballots. And, and they were, all those objections were pulled eventually, but it was obnoxious to see that happening. And there was video of a paper ballot canvas in Onondaga County where one election lawyer challenged a ballot uh, and then the poll, the poll inspectors were the ballot inspectors were all chuckling because the person had basically written on the on the on the envelope who they were voting for. And when the lawyer found out it was probably for his candidate, he said, "Oh, okay, I'm withdrawing my challenge." Well, that's ridiculous, right? The question is, is the voter eligible? Not whether who they did they vote who you wanted them to vote for, right? You don't get to object because the person happens to be a member of the party that is not yours. So I, I find the challenge process uh, abusive and offensive. And um, I've recommended that the challenge process be changed so that if the Board of Elections determines that a vote should be counted, that's it, you count the ballot, right? If the Board of Elections determines that a vote should be rejected, then you can challenge that determination so that it's a one-way ratchet. We're making sure that ballots that are getting thrown out, that might be thrown out, that those are subject to as much process as possible so that we're not disenfranchising people, but we're not giving candidates and election lawyers wild swings at being able to disenfranchise eligible voters because they might think, oh, well, that signature doesn't match because it's different from when they signed their registration form when they were 18 and now they're in their 70s. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm with you in that the challenge process is, is obnoxious and needs to be uh, curtailed severely. Janice, I saw your hand up before. Do you have a question? Yeah, yeah no, I had a comment. Um, years and years ago when we lived in Rensselaer County, 
we lived in West Sand Lake, we would go to vote at the, I think it was a local elementary school and they always had a bake sale going on in the same, in the gymnasium. And so everybody went to vote and then to the bake sale. <laughs> uh, it's a fabulous idea. Yeah, it's a absolutely. fantastic idea, yeah. right? You, I mean, and, and it's funny because it gets around the problem, right? You can't, you can't give things away for voting. Right? That's illegal. You can't say, I mean, this happens and it's, it's not like a horrible affront to democracy, but it is technically illegal to say, right, show me your I voted sticker and I'll give you a free cup of coffee. Technically illegal. Um, right. But you can certainly say, go vote, and we're going to have this bake sale next door, and you can come right. buy some delicious baked goods out of your own pocket, right? That's To me, that's a public service. It's not a public service for my waistline, but it certainly is for my taste buds. And so I, I'm all in favor of bake sales in every polling place, except mine. <laughs> that was the case where, in my, the town where I grew up, too, and my mother worked, she worked on the polls, and there was always a bake sale that was for the PTA, the bake sale, that's where the proceeds went to the PTA, but yeah, you brought up a memory there, Janice. <laughs> you know, and look, that's, and that's serving a dual purpose, right? Getting people to vote, getting people fed, raising money for the PTA. I mean, if this doesn't sound like a project, I don't know what does. Ah, uh, I think I think we're okay with everyone getting in their questions and comments. Um, Perry, thank you for your very enthusiastic presentation on voter suppression. As you know, this is one of our core values of League of Women Voters, so it's great to have this. And for those of uh, those of us that didn't know all the things you presented, it was very helpful. And for those of us who did, a great refresher course. So um, I don't think I have anything else to comment on um, outside of thanking Perry. And uh, there will be no holiday party this year, correct? It's, we can't have one outside. So unfortunately it's too cold in upstate New York. So, so we'll see everyone, I guess, in January at one of the many events. Oh, and Linda's film. Yes, okay, I'm and Linda's film. And I think <laughs> yeah. that's it. The Thank whitewashed you. event in Saratoga on the 6th, Linda, is that correct? December 6th, snow date is the 7th. And you can check our, our website or our Facebook page and the event will be listed there. Correct, with the link to the ticket. Yep, Yep. you can get, get your free it's ticket free. on the right? Free ticket. Yep. <laughs> we, we are having book club still in December. Yes, yeah. um, book club is also, I believe, on our website under the events list. Um, so that is also still on. Okay, so I guess that's it. Thank you, everyone, for coming, and uh, we'll see you in January. Thanks so much for meeting. Appreciate for it. meet up. Bye bye. <laughs>